will, hopefully. Uh, what we're going to do is do this worksheet first from chapter 5 and 6, and then uh, we'll look into 7. And at the end of the class, we'll determine if we're going to have the test on Monday during class or take home after class so that we can finish reviewing 7. So I'm going to pass these out. Can you see this on your screen? Okay. So we're going to talk about floor framing. And um, <clears throat> it says to review figures 5.15 and 5.18 in the chapter subsections, planning the frame, erecting the frame, and attach attaching the frame to the foundation, referring to the sidebar for preliminary design of a wood light frame structure. Jot down the maximum spans of a 2x8, 2x10, and 2x12. So let's look that up. That's figure 5.15, 5.18. Whoever finds it, yell out the page. I assume it's in chapter 5. 186. 186. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so you can see a framing plan there, and I think that's similar to the slide that we looked at. Uh, what? On the on page 186, you have a floor framing plan, um, and it says to jot down the spans 5.15 through 5.18. Uh, <clears throat> you can see the details on page 187 of how uh, you know, the end walls, uh, cantilever detail. Remember, we talked about that the other day. Um, so you can study those. Where's the span? Do we see? I'm looking on page 191 now where it says floor framing. Solid lumber floor joists typically range from a 2x6 for lighter loaded floors and short joist spans to 2x12 for heavier loads and longer spans. They are most commonly placed at 16 inches or 24. We're going to use 16 inches as can be seen in figure 5.17. This ensures support for the ends of the subflooring. Um, because the, what it's talking about there is when you lay the plywood on top, you have uh, the plywood is 4 by 8. So if your joists are spaced at 16 or 24, you'll always have a joist at the end of the plywood to nail it down. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, doesn't really give you the span, though. Y'all see that anywhere? I thought there would be a chart. Well, shoot. Let's move on. Okay, examine the floor plan, searching for the simple arrangement of joists and beams working with the span uh, limits noted above. To avoid complications for the carpenters, use one size joist throughout, meaning you don't want to have a 2x6 here and a 2x12 there. So you need to decide on the maximum size of your, the maximum size you need, and then stick with that throughout. So they'll all be even. Um, so you draw the beams, uh, draw in the beams and location post, assuming that the beams can span 15 to 20 feet between supports. Add double headers and timbers around the stairs, chimneys, and other floor openings. Okay, let's... Um, 
we can keep looking at this while we, I'm going to flip to the next page on the screen, but y'all have it there. So you have, this is your, what you're going to frame. This, you're looking down on the foundation. So uh, let's say that we are going to use, um, let's see. Okay, first it says to do the post, right? Assuming that you can span 15 or 20 feet. So here's some walls above that they've dotted in that you'll need to support. Uh, and from that other picture on page 186, you can see that you're going to need a, a beam down the middle. So you're going to need post probably somewhere in here. Let me see if I can draw on here without... Uh, turning off the screen. No, it was going to let me. maybe I can draw. So you're going to need post um, down this middle and you want the post to be even. You're probably going to want one under this wall here. So you're going to draw a little post there. Now, I can't draw very well using this mouse. So Then um, you're probably going to have a post uh, or a, a point here. Then you've got this whole span right here. So you want to, uh, you'll have a support here. So you want to sort of go in the middle of this so it'll be evenly spaced, right? So you're going to draw a post there. Yours will be circles. Can you see the grid on your paper? Kind of, sort of. Each square is about one foot. So I can't see it on this, on the screen, but that's probably about right to have the post there. So then, um, so you're going to add a beam. The beam will be, um, resting on the post. So you can draw your beam. I'm going to draw it like a center line. best I can. <laughs> so there's your your beam. You're, oh, you're probably also going to have a post over here at this intersection. Do I need to turn on those slides from the other day? Does that to go, sort of go back and forth? Or are y'all getting, get, getting it? <clears throat> So if you look at the pictures in the book, you kind of can see the same thing. Okay, then it says, um, draw the beam. Okay, around your openings, which are the stairs and the chimneys and other floor openings, you're going to draw a double joist. So, we've drawn our beams probably have a beam here too, like this, going this way, all the way to there. Okay, so here's your stair right here. So you're, here you're going to draw a solid line indicating a double joist around this opening. Like that. And this is the foundation wall, so you don't need anything over there. And let's see. You're going to draw at the fireplace. You're going to have a double joist or double header resting on the edge of the fireplace because there's going to be a lot of things coming into that resting there. A 
around the perimeter you're going to have your rim joist which you can see um, if you look on page 187 at those details there this beam right here is you see the post down on D on the bottom right of page 187 these are the that's the post and then you got this beam which is the metal beam sitting on top of that and then we're going to draw joists going this way which are on top of that so uh, but it, then if you look up at detail A on page 187 you see that there's a a rim joist which is the one that's on the very edge of the foundation so you're going to have one of those that just follows the very edge of your foundation all the way around again I can't draw very well with the mouse but try <laughs> so I'm going to go there huh <laughs> yeah then all your other ones will feed into that okay well, it stops there, and these double headers feed into it because the fireplace is going to be brick resting on top of that. So, so then uh, back to our this span here, from like there all the way to there, is going to be pretty big. So you're probably going to need a double header here under this wall resting on that post. So draw two lines as close as you can together right there for your double header. So now you got a pretty even situation. Um, you know, this is a pretty even span right here. You know, and, and both of these are even. So you can start drawing your joist. Oh, wait, one more thing. Uh, you're going to have a cantilevering, cantilevered bay right here. So the edges of that need to be supported by a double joist. So you'll draw that back to your middle support system. Two lines there, and two lines there. So that that'll have some extra support. Now, what you need to do is is start drawing your lines, uh, and we'll use 16 inches apart. And that on your squares, you know, that'll be like a square and a quarter when you're looking at your squares on your drawing. So you're just, and if you want to use a different color or a different line style can. I'll, I'll use a different color just to make it pretty. Um, so you're going to start drawing a joist all, you know, a line all the way across roughly 16 inches apart. Um, when you get over here, it will stop at the stairs. I'm not going to draw all of them, but I'm going to show you that it stops at the stairs. And then you're going to have to have joist hangers, which are going to be little pieces of like an L right at the edge of that. So that's what it's attached to that with. So you'll have to draw those things if you can see that on there. And you can see that on the, the sketch on page 186 on that different floor framing plan. And you'll do that over here at the fireplace too where it butts into that. You'll draw the little... Uh, joist hangers. <clears throat> so finish that for a few minutes. I'm going to stop recording while y'all are finishing. Zoom. So if you go to the next page, uh, we're, we're going to talk about roof pitches. Um, so the basic building block of all pitched roof configurations is the shed or the single. There's just one slope here. That's a shed roof. Two sheds together make a gable. There's a gable at the end. That's what's called the gable. Uh, two intersecting gables make a hip. These ridges here are the hips. So in all, most houses, a lot of houses are all hip roofs or partial hip, part partial gable. And then you can also add a dormer where uh, it's a gable roof on this case, and then it's like a little mini gable coming out of it. Um, pitched roofs can be added together to shelter almost any collection of interior spaces, as you can see here. We have some shed roofs, we have pitched roofs, we have gable roofs, and we have a dormer. Is there any questions on that? Those are just the basic 
shape, shapes of roots. So on the next page, um, it says the easiest way to do calculations with root pitches is to set up a proportion using the given rise and run. So when we talk about the rise and the run, the rise obviously is going up, the run is going horizontally. So in this case, the run is 12. For every 12 inches or 12 feet, you're going to rise 5 inches or 5 feet. So it wants you to find the height of Y of the roof at a distance of 7 foot 6 from the edge. So it's just a uh, proportion, right? So you're going to go, your proportion is 5 and 12, and you want to find Y over 7.5. So 5 over 12 equals Y over 7.5. You do the algebra, flip it around, twist it up, and you get Y equals 3.125 feet or 3 foot 1 and a half inches. Is there any questions on how they did that? Understanding roofs is an important thing. Okay, this other example, what is the horizontal distance from the eave from the, the eave, excuse me, at what horizontal distance from the eave will this roof have a, a risen, would have risen, I can't talk, would have risen six feet. Okay, <laughs> so, so you still got a slope, you call this the slope or the rise and the run, so you got a slope of 5 and 12, and we, in this case we want to know x after we've risen six feet. So it's just, you do the proportions again, you got 12 over 5 equals x over 6, so x equals 6 times 12 over 5, or x equals 14.4 feet, or in inches, 14 foot, 4 and a half inches. So that's pretty simple. And the reason you might need this, for instance, is if um, you're going to step up your ceiling or something like that, and you know you need 6 feet of clearance, so you'll want to know what that distance is. Of course, you know, nowadays you can cut sections through of it and just look at it, but um, old days you had to figure it out mathematically. So, so there's that. Okay, here on the next page, study the two examples below, then draw roof plans and thumbnail perspectives. These are the thumbnail perspectives of 10 more ways of covering an L-shaped building with the roof, roof pitch at 8 and 12, meaning it goes over 12 inches and up 8 inches. So the main thing you want to remember is, if you look at this picture here, you've got two gables running together. So the slope is 8 and 12 um, for all sides, so your ridge, which is the top, is going to be in the middle. So you're going to have a line here, and then a line down that middle, and then you're going to have a horizontal or a diagonal line that runs across there. This, this is a ridge and this is a valley. Can, this is the valley right here. Can you all see that? Do you understand that? In this situation, they made two shed roofs. A really tall one here, and the shorter one that bumps into it. These are slope arrows here. This, if you can, you can probably see it better on your sheet. Um, you know, this one slopes down, and that one slopes down. So now you want to think of some more configurations. Um, let me move that over so I can draw a few for you, and then you can move on. So if you have um, your L shape. Drawing it very roughly. Um, so what else could could we do? We could have all hip roots. So you still you know that your line is gonna your ridge is. I'm just sketching now. But then on a hip roof, all of these ridges are gonna be at a 45. So then you would erase this thing because you wouldn't have a ridge there. This would run in to the ridge. Same over here. You draw a 45 because this this slope right here equals this slope, so they always hit at a 45. Uh, let's erase that one. And then you're also going to have a valley here and a ridge there. So if you're and this will be really tricky for me to do here. Let's see. You're going to draw your thumbnail view. Which I'm not doing very well. 
<laughs> and draw your walls. Kind of like an axonometric, if y'all have taken art. Call it a 45. So you, you got your front edge that you can see, and you know, you're going to know that this is a hip. So you're going to draw that kind of as best you can. probably wouldn't see the other side. You might see this side. But very poor sketch, but do you get the picture? <laughs> okay. So, uh, and I'm not grading your artistic abilities just yet. <laughs> so, so I want you to try to think of uh, some more situations. Just remember, um, let me bring this back over here. On this shed, remember when you're thinking about this, this obviously has to be lower than this roof because if it's higher, it's going to think about how the water runs. You know, the water's going to run off here, it's going to run down and run off there. If this was higher than that, there'd be like a big leak issue. So you kind of want to think about those things. So see if you can come up with some more. Maybe I'll do one more for you. Or, or do you want to come up with some? I mean, it's kind of lim unlimited. Yeah, think up different, and, and draw the little slope arrows. I didn't do that. You know, that slopes down. You don't have to write the numbers. That slopes down. That slopes down. That slopes down. Always slope toward the ground. Not It will never slope up. <laughs> like that. So I'll do one more. Let's see. See if I can draw better this time. Uh, so you could have one that's, um, I'm going to try to do as many as you can. You could have one that's kind of convoluted. Let me see if I can draw this. This part over here is a gable roof, and this slope goes down, this slope goes down, and then this gable, I'm, I'm stopping it here, and this is just going to, sorry, continue to go up. Actually, I did that. I did that wrong. Hold on. There's not an arrow there. This, the arrow actually is going to go this way, and I'll show you why in a second. Is that right? Yes. So this is all sloped. This is all one big sloping surface down. And then this is a little shed roof on the side. So if I can draw my sketch somewhat, we're going to have that. There's the top. Ooh. Goes up there. Goes up there. Goes up there. This is very bad. Okay, hold on. <laughs> This is going to be a low wall here, and you're going to have a shed roof that comes up to there. Does that make sense? Can you kind of decipher what I was doing? So you got your arrow down there, and then you got your arrow down here. That's a pretty complicated one. There's much more simpler solutions that you could draw. <clears throat> but just understanding how roofs works works is the point here. So draw a few of those. You don't necessarily have to fill up the whole page, but I'll come by and look at you. Resume. The test will um, be like your homework on Monday. So, and it'll be due by the time you come back to class 
Wednesday, but you'll, it'll be uh, it'll be time limited to the amount of time in class, and it'll be or it'll be two hours, and it'll be open book. And I will post on uh, face on Facebook on uh, on Canvas. <laughs> Um, uh, like I did last time, I gave you phrases or words that you should, yeah, I'll, I'll put it like as, as a discussion on our Canvas page. I'll do that today. But, uh, so we'll go through chapter seven right now and we'll do is whatever we can. And then, uh, I hate being behind. Okay. <laughs> okay. So this is chapter seven. It's talking about interior finishes and uh, when we talk about interior finishes, um, I'm sitting down because I have to be right by this microphone. Uh, <laughs> anyway, when we talk about interior finishes, we're not talking about like the linoleum in this case or the paint or the jip board. We're talking about the guts of the house. We're going to talk about plumbing and electrical and stuff like that. We're going to talk about finishes like you might think, like the paint and the flooring and stuff like that in another chapter. So this is just a, a layout of how the plumbing might be. Um, in, this, in this case, we're talking about um, the vent, which every plumbing system has to have a vent because uh, that's how the gases escape. And then you've also got your, your traps, and the traps are there because um, that traps water. There's always water in that little U. And the reason that they do that is because that keeps the smell from coming back up in your sink or your toilet or your tub. I don't know if you've ever been into a bathroom that really stinks and you can't figure out why. There's probably a floor drain in that bathroom where the trap water has dried up. And so you're getting the sewer smell. So if you just pour a bucket of water down that floor drain, it usually fixes the problem. Simple solution. Um, uh, there's just, I'm not going to read all of these because this, I think I put, put this online. So, okay. So y'all can study these. Um, water supply, in this case, you have the hot water and the cold water. You got your water heater in the basement. And, uh, you know, if you can, you want to try to keep things close together. You know, your design is more important than, I mean, you don't have to have all the bathrooms in one corner of the house. But, you know, if it's convenient, you can, it's, it's certainly, less it's less expensive. Yeah. Less piping, less money. So. There's uh, some plumbing in a bathroom. You can you see the wood framing, and you can see nowadays they use this plastic type of piping. And if we get to go on a home tour, you'll see that uh, because this is a lot flexible. Piping is a lot easier to use. They still use the copper uh, right at the connections, but it's so expensive that this... Um, you know, for the most part, they'd rather run this through the house. And the reason for that, for the copper being the copper? Uh, it's more, much more stable. It doesn't, you know, it won't, uh, it gives a more sturdy connection. Um, also notice these little clips here, or these plates. And that's there uh, when, when plumbing or, or wires or anything runs through. And, you know, eventually you're going to nail your sheetrock on here. So you put these uh, metal plates over that so that the... Because the nail, the sheetrock nailer doesn't care. He's just using his nail gun free willy, and bam, 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 bam. So that'll stop the nails from going in and puncturing the pipe. Or what would it also do for like a, a stud slider or something like that? Like a, you know how they have those little metal detectors uh, for the nails? Yeah. Um, well, no, this wouldn't help you necessarily in a stud finder. This just keeps people from nailing into the pipe. It's about a 16. It's not that thick, but you'll know it if you hit it with a hammer. I mean, it'll it'll stop the nail. So. Oh, okay. And even a, I mean, a nail gun, it won't stop? Yeah. Okay. Let's see what this is. Oh, I like this video. Okay. How long is it? Two minutes. You can watch it. <laughs> With most people, all they know about the plumbing in their home is that when they turn on the faucet, mm -hmm. <laughs> another part of the guts is the HVAC system. And in this case, they have a basement, and that's where their furnace is. And then uh, that comes up, and you have your supply ducts, 
for either your hot or your your this is your main one and then you'll have another one that'll go up in this case to the second floor here we usually have our stuff in the attic um, because we don't have basements but uh, you also need a return air grill on each floor and then these are the supplies and then in this case they're in the floor and you have a heat pump or an outside condensing unit on the outside of the house that runs the freon or the cold or hot water into the furnace for the heat exchanger so you need to have that uh, system planned out there's a, a real look at it um, you got your furnace over here and you got the big long duct duct going that way here's a closer look um, can't see that picture very well I think that's a it says termination of okay yeah that there's going to be a grill over that that'll be a supply duct into a room that's looking up into a ceiling another way to heat is radiant heating in the floor in which case you'd have like a hot water system runs all through all these pipes and that just keeps the floor warm that's good in arid climates so like when you only really need to warm up the floor in the morning like in San Diego or Arizona or something like that here we don't uh, we also need to treat the air for humidity so we don't use that much here there's a, a look at it and the floor system and here you can see all the electrical wires you have to plan that this is your uh, where it all comes in your cable I mean, cable box your what do you call it panel and on the outside will be the meter uh, on the outside of the house and all those wires have are going somewhere in the house Here you see how that stuff runs through the joist, like we had the joist we looked at the other day, and they punched holes in it. And now you can have your pipes and your wires going through it. The only thing you probably can't really put through it is ductwork because that's so large. So your ductwork will have to run parallel. Here uh, you can see the little nail guards and the wires. Uh, and then this, is, this isn't a nail guard, it's a structural strapping that we talked about. Uh, here's a, a box for a plug and you notice how it's you can see it's sticking out a little bit because the sheetrock is going to be a half inch thick so you don't want this to be behind you want it to be flush when they put the cover plate on so they stick that out a little bit here's a fireplace um, that they've put in this house and you can see I don't know if you can see what we were doing a while ago yeah above it so completing the building enclosure so then you have the insulation this is bat fiber insulation this is probably what you used to use a lot but in reality it's not very good because there's lots of crevices that air can creep through uh, sometimes you have to use it it's good for sound like if an interior wall if you want to insulate the bedroom from the living room you can put that in that wall but for insulating purposes as far as air it's it's not that good anymore um, they got unfaced and paper faced it also itches so. <laughs> um, here's just another look at it they also this is like a foam insulation they squirt when you can't really stick anything in there but it fills up the gap here's the uh, spray foam insulation this is the, the best kind of insulation it's also the most expensive but once you get all your wiring and piping in then you can just spray that in and it fills in the whole thing it's very tight this is the next best thing which is blown in cellulose and you can't see it but there's a thin net over that was stapled onto these studs and uh, there's a hole in the netting and then they blow in that stuff and it fills in you know all the gaps not quite as good as the foam but uh, it's better than the, the bat insulation is it less expensive than the foam? yes here's another uh, they put a vapor retarder on this one for some reason okay we got two movies but we're almost out of time let me see how much left we got here okay why don't we just stop there I, want, I like these movies so I want to show them so uh, we'll finish this chapter and you've already, supposedly already read it so what I would suggest you do is uh, 
as soon as I post that review, go ahead and start reviewing for the test on the chapters we've done to now so that you don't have to, you know, just cram it all in Monday night. <laughs> I'll put that up today. today. Yeah. And uh, so the test will be, um, yeah, it'll be like homework. Uh, and then we'll go into the next. We'll go, if you're going to read ahead, like if you don't have anything to do this weekend, remember we're starting on 11 and 12 next week because um, we have the brick thing at the end of the month. So I wanted to line brick up with that. So. <laughs> Um, well, these are some worksheets we're going to do on stairs. Do you, you, I mean, it's kind of like last time. I think so, but we're going to do it in class. Okay. So, because I think it's better if I help y'all. If you have the extra credit, hand that in. It, there wasn't a due date, I don't think, on that. 